inshallah we'll get started. Uh, there's a saying here uh, that everything I needed to know, or everything I needed to know in life, I learned in kindergarten. You know, and uh, so, you know, so those who haven't graduated from kindergarten, it doesn't apply to them. Uh, but those who have graduated from kindergarten, or if they didn't go to kindergarten, graduated from something else after the kindergarten, because I went to kindergarten for five days. Uh, but, uh, you know, it applies to them. And part of that is that, you know, everything you learned, you learned at that young age, you know, caring, sharing, all of those things. And also, it also includes, like, if somebody's talking, listening. You know, there's this tendency of, of just, you know, somebody else is talking, everybody else is talking, and so no one's listening. Uh, and then they say, oh, I can't remember what you said. Well, if you can't listen, if you're not listening, you're not going to remember. Uh, so, and then, you know, and it also it's courtesy, one, to those who are trying to listen, and two, to the speaker himself, because, you know, these are things that, you know, and especially when we're talking about Rasulullah Sallallahu when we're talking about those that are connected to him that he loves, you know, you can't just use any word. You know, you have to be careful with how you word things uh, to make sure that it doesn't fall into a category where you're being disrespectful. Uh, you also, you know, the other thing that happens is you also have to think so you're not continuously talking. You know, part of the problem is that there's so much information and you got to condense it and choose what you need to say and what, what needs to be left out at the time. You know, otherwise we could be talking about say the Qadi Jilani Rahmatullahi all night long. And for the next few years, uh, we don't have the appetite for that. Uh, so it helps, you know, if, we, if the person talking can think about what he's talking about. Uh, so, uh, you know, inshallah, yeah, inshallah we'll get started. Uh, is, any, is there anybody else who wants to recite any, anything, you know, not or anything, before I start, inshallah? Uh, we'll see, we'll see. نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغذوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم وتسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ونان محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وآله وصحبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Yeah, I clipped it on here because if I clip it down here, it doesn't pick up the voice very well. So, uh, but um, you know, some people think that I that I kind of give too much information sometimes so they can't follow. Uh, to me, I sound like a broken record uh, because I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, for those who come to Juma here, you know, and listen to the talk in its entirety, most of this will be review, uh, which is also good. You know, it helps you remember. Uh, You know, we're here again to talk about Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullah. You know, Sultani Awliya Allah. He is the king 
uh, of the friends of Allah. Uh, and in order to to understand, you know, him, we need to kind of understand and understand the uh, background a little bit. Uh, because, you know, a lot of people, we, when we talk about him, we talk about the miracles he did and this and everything else. Uh, the, uh, but if you don't understand who he is and why all of this is significant, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, so, uh, as we mentioned before, and I won't say that anymore, because I know there's a lot of things I've mentioned before. Uh, but that just takes up time. Uh, so if, if I've said it again, just know I, I already know I've said it again. Okay? But uh, Rasulullah SAW said in a hadith which is narrated by Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, who is the teacher of Imam Bukhari, he mentions it in two places, so not just once, but in two different books, where Rasulullah SAW said that my nur and the nur of Ali are one nur. And they were one nur until 14,000 years before the creation of Adam alayhi salam. Which becomes important to understand because then we understand that when the nur of Rasulullah is placed within Adam alayhi salam, which is what gives him life, along with that nur is the nur of Ali. And so this nur travels through the generations. You now, like Rasulullah Sussam said that I was passed from a pure loin to a pure womb, womb, and that none of my an none of his ancestors. He said none of my ancestors were affected by the effects of ignorance. So all of his ancestors were pure. And he also says that I was passed from generation to generation in the best of each generation. So his ancestors are the best of the generations. So for every generation, whichever ancestor he's being carried in, his nur is being carried in, that ancestor is the best of that generation throughout the world. Until this nur, or these two nurs, came into the loin of Hazrat Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Rasulullah. And so from here, the nur of Nabuwa, or the nur or the light of prophethood, is passed on to Hazrat Abdullah, the father of Rasulullah. And the nur of Wilaya, or the nur of friendship of Allah, which is the nur of Sayyidina Ali. Is passed on to his father, Hazrat Abu Talib. So when you look at this, again, Rasulullah says that he's being passed on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, in Surah Shu'ara, you know, that I see you, uh, I see you standing, and I saw and I see you as you were being passed in. You know, among those who prostrate. So again, the, the purity of the, of the ancestry of Rasulullah, which is also the purity of the ancestry of Sayyidina Ali. Ali. You know? And so now the question comes, what are these Noor doing? What is this Noor that's being passed on doing? You know, and Allah SWT tells us in the Quran what the Nur of Wilaya, what the Nur of Nabuwa is doing. You know, in Surah Al Imran, verse 81 and 82. So Surah number three, verse 81 and 82, where he says, "Wa id awd billah min shaitan rajim, wa id akhad Allah mithaq al Nabiyina, the ma'ataytukum min kitabin wa hikma." You know, saying to Rasulullah SAW, and remember. You know, he's saying, you know, you can't say and remember to just anybody. And I'm not going to go into the details of the verse because that's going to take a long time. But again, this means that Rasulullah is present when this is happening. 
present and seeing. You know, so and remember when that when when the when the covenant when this ahad when this oath was taken by the pro, by, uh, by the prophets that you will be given a book and wisdom. So all 124,000 plus or minus prophets are present. And they are said, and it's said to them that when you are given a book and the wisdom. You know, and then comes to you this messenger. And not just any messenger, Rasulun. Which means what? You know, Tanween is used for Azmat, to show status, to show significance. So this means when this messenger, when this Rasul, you know, at this point, the Anbiya, the Nabi, they're in the process of getting their Nabuwa. The Rasulullah is already Rasul. So it's when you will, you, and this Rasul comes to you, comes, then Allah says, says, what, then what do you do? Will you help him? You give him assistance and you follow him. And then he says, well, you, do, you, do you take this covenant? And they agree to the covenant. You know, and then once they agree, then they're given prophethood. Again, Rasulullah is already a Rasul. You know, the verse continues on, and then the warning comes in verse 82. You know, so again, we're not going to go into the details of this, but look it up. Read it. And read it with the understanding because unfortunately many times the translators when they translate it when they say when any Rasul comes or when a Rasul comes which is not what the verse says because the verse says Rasulun when this Rasul of the Rasuls comes when this highly elevated Rasul comes you know like in Urdu we say you know Barishan wala Rasul when that Rasul comes Rasulun that's what it means because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said Rasul, and he didn't. So when that Rasul comes, then you, you give up your seat, you become his follower, and you support him. And then you take this, you, you, you take, and he asked, do you take this oath? And they said, we take this oath. And he said, then be a, be a witness, and I am also a witness some, over you. And, you know, you got to understand this is being taken, this oath is being taken by the prophets who are the most truthful of all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says that. Siddiq is actually a title of the prophets. So what is Rasulullah, so what is the nur of Rasulullah Sassim doing as it's being passed through the generations? It's teaching the Nabis how to be Nabi. It's teaching the Anbiya how to be prophets. It is giving them the virtues that they need to be a prophet. The Rasulullah is teaching the prophets how to be prophets and giving them the, the tools they need to be prophets. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said about Sayyidina Ali Karam Allah, Man kuntu mawla, fahada Ali al mawla. That for whomsoever I am his protecting friend, I am his mawla, which is more than just protecting friend. Protector, caretaker, the one who, who, who looks after you and raises you and, and teaches you what you need to know. Man kuntu mawla fahada this Ali. You know, as he's holding the hand of Sayyidina Ali Karmallah Waj. This Ali is also his mawla. And there's no time limit on this. You know, for, Rasu for Ali, he's Rasulullah Sassim is mawla kainat. And, and Rasulullah Sassim has made Ali mawla kainat. No wali became wali without Ali. 
And so Ali is teaching the walis how to be walis. Even before his birth. Just like Rasulullah is teaching the Anbiya, the Prophets, how to be Prophets before his birth, Ali is teaching the Walis how to be Walis before his birth. Qadi Sanallah Pani Pati Rahmatullah, who wrote Tafsir al Mazari. Uh, who he is the student of or the or the uh, Khalifa of Mirza Mazare Jani Jana Rahmatullah This is Naqshbandi Silsila uh, He writes in the tafsir that, that Ali Radin was distributing wilaya that no one became wali whether in this ummah or previous ummahs without Ali Radin distributing it to him And along with Ali Radin there is Bibi Fatima doing, you know, helping him in this work. And so after the birth of Ali, this process continued. No one became wali without Ali. You know, Bibi Maryam, she is the mother of a prophet, but she is not a prophet. She is only Allah, she is the friend of Allah. So even her friendship of Allah is through Ali. Every companion of Rasulullah is only Allah. They are not prophets. The distribution of wilaya is again through Ali. You know, and when we talk, you know, those who are here before. You know, when we talked about Sayyidina Ali, when we talked about Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, you know, we talked about the connection between the two. You know, and the love and affection between the two. So then, you know, Ali is born. This process continues. Rasulullah declares his prophethood. You know, the process of distributing wilaya continues. And along with him again is his wife, Bibi Fatima, alayya, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And then, who was also included in this process? Imam Hassan alayhi wa Then Imam Hussein alayhi wa And then the son of Imam Hussein alayhi wa Imam Zain al and then his son Imam Muhammad Baqir, and then his son Imam Jafar Sadiq, and then his son Imam Musa Qadir, and then his son Imam Ali Rida, and then his son Imam Muhammad Taqi, and then his son Imam Ali Hadi, and then his son Imam Hassan Askari. And then there is a break. No one else is included into this. You know, it's understood Imam Mahdi al-Islam was included as part of this, but no one else was included into this until Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullah. You know, so this is his company. And this is his job. You know, this is his purpose. You know, if you look at Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullah, and also if you look at, you know, this, this process, All of the legitimate scholars, irregardless of which fiqh, school of fiqh they follow, or which uh, silsila as far as spirituality they belong to, uh, all of them agree upon this order, and all of them also agree upon the fact that uh, you know, at any moment in time, the leader of the only Allah is always from the family of Rasulullah. You know, either from Imam Hassan or Imam Hussein al Islam or from both. You look like even at the Tabi'i, you know, during the time of Tabi'i. Those who saw the companions of Rasulullah. So, among Medina Munawwar, you have seven fuqaha. 
very famous, you know, scholars, you know, and they include names such as, you know, great scholars such as Sayyid bin Musayyib, uh, Urwa bin Zubair, uh, Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah ibn Utbah bin Masood, you know, Qasim bin Muhammad bin Abu Bakr, But all of them acknowledge Imam Zain al Abidin as their leader, as their master. Even though Qasim bin Muhammad uh, bin Abi Bakr, he is the father-in-law of Muhammad bin, uh, Imam Muhammad Bakr. He is the maternal grandfather of Imam Jafar Sadiq. And yet he acknowledges Imam Zain al Abidin as his master and leader. Now this is throughout history. Uh, and so we were talking earlier about Ghos. You know, and so uh, to understand Ghos, you know, Ghos is, you know, you have the spiritual realm. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he creates Adam al Islam, he says to the angels as he's creating Adam al Islam, what does he say? He says you know, again, this starts off with وَإِذْ وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَعَلُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ Saying to Rasulullah Sallallahu and remember, again, he is present. Because you can't say, and remember this to somebody who wasn't even there, who didn't see what happened. Allah Subhanahu wa says, and remember, وَإِذْ أَخَدَ وَإِذْ with Allah Rabbu. Remember when your Lord said to the angels that I will create a vice chair on earth. Hmm? Of course, what did the angels say? Oh, that are you going to create another creation on the earth that will create blood, you know, mischief and bloodshed? While we sing your praises and honor and honor you, and we don't sin and we have never sinned and we never plan on sinning, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows this. The interesting thing is when they said this, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala didn't deny it. He didn't say no, 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 no. They're not going to be like this. And you look at mankind today, and what do you see? Mischief and bloodshed. So he didn't deny it. You know, like you go to a court and somebody accuses you, well, if, you, if it's not true, then you deny it. Angels are accusing mankind that he's going to do this and this and this. Allah SWT says, what does he say? Inni ma ta'lamun. That you don't know what I know. Hmm? Yes, mankind will do this, but then within mankind, there will be others as well. This is why we're supposed to recite durood in abundance, durood and salam in abundance, especially on Juma, Because on Juma, Allah SWT allows the angels to come down to the earth and see what's going on. And when they see us reciting durood and sending salam upon Rasulullah SAW, this is the work of the angels. This is what Allah SWT Himself is doing. And so when they see this, then they hold their heads low. They say, we were wrong to object. Even though they see everything else. But just because of a few that do this, they realize their mistake. But coming back to, Inni ja'ilum fil ardi khalifa. You know, vice chair on earth. If you look at Khilafah, there are two kinds of Khilafah. You have Khilafah Zariya, which is the apparent Khilafah. Yeah. And of course, the, all the Prophets are Khalifa. But the first Khalifa in this process, without break, is Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. You know, dealing with the apparent issues. And then you have Khilafah Ba'atmiyah, which is the hidden Khilafah. 
And the Khalifa in this field, without break, is Sayyidina Ali. Radiallahu. And then those that have joined him from his from from the from the lineage of Rasulullah, those who have joined him in the process. Abdul Qadir Jilani you know, his father on his father's side he's from the lineage of Imam Hassan al -Salam. And from his mother's side he's from the lineage of Imam Hussein al -Salam. You know, so he's what you refer to as pure Sayyid. Sayyid Tarfain. Tarfain. Yeah, so on both sides. His, you know, we talk in Juma about the way his parents were 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 wed. Uh, you know, to briefly go over that, you know, his father, whose name was Musa, known as Abu Salih, uh, and he was a great worship of Allah, and he was a scholar, and he was a mujahid. Uh, and he was, you know, traveling and he was making wudu on the edge of a river and he hadn't eaten for a few days and he sees this apple floating down the river. So, you know, of course your stomach is calling and it's hungry. So without thinking, he picks up the apple and he eats the apple. And then after he eats the apple, you know, he starts thinking that I was not the owner of that apple. You know, the owner of the apple, you know, in Islam, you can't just pick up something on you know, laying around and claim it to be your own. So he said, I did not have permission of the, of the owner, even though technically in Sharia, because he had been hungry for more than three days, he could have eaten the apple without any hesitation. He ate it, but now he's thinking, I did not have the permission of the owner. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask me on the day of judgment then what answer will I give? So he starts walking upstream and then as he's walking he sees this apple orchard with branches leaning over into over the river and he realizes this is where this apple came from. So he goes to the owner of the, you know he walks in the garden looking around looking for the owner he finds the owner the owner's name is Abdullah Somi. And he asks him, he says, are you the owner? He says, yes. And he tells him what happened. He says, you know, I ate this apple. So, you know, either, either forgive me or take the price of the apple. So, Abdullah Somi, Rahmatullah he says, well, I'm not going to forgive you nor am I going to take the price of the apple. But if you want forgiveness for that apple, now you have to fulfill certain requirements of mine. He said, what's that? And he says, I'm ready to do whatever. He says, you have to serve me in the garden for 10 years. You know, I mean, The lives of the only Allah, the friends of Allah, parallel the lives of the prophets. The, prophets. the miracles of the only Allah, the friends of Allah, parallel the miracles of the prophets. You know, if you read the story of Musa al-Islam when he killed the Egyptian and, and left Egypt and went to Madain and then he, he goes to you know, there and read it and read the Quran and read it. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but then, you know, the story of, of Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani's parents, his father, parallels the story of Musa al -Salam. So he says, you have to serve me for 10 years, then, I, then I'll think about it. And he says, is there no other way? He said, I'll pay you whatever you want. He said, there's no price you can give me, except you have to serve me. So if that's what it takes, you know, because this was not a man who was willing to take something haram and put it into his system. 
He was not a short-sighted man. He's looking long. He's looking at the hereafter. So he says, if that's what it takes, then that's what I'll do. And there's a purpose behind why Abdullah Sone is doing what he's doing as well. And so, 10 years pass. You know, he's in the garden. He's serving, you know, doing what he needs to be doing, taking care of the garden, remembering his Lord, and remembering Rasulullah. So after 10 years, he comes to the owner and he says to Abdullah Sumi, he says, you know, time is up. I've fulfilled the 10 years, so forgive me. And he says, no. He says, you have to serve me another three years. So 13 years. Same thing happens, you know, three years pass by. Now he comes back and he says, okay, I'm ready. You know, it, it's, it's time to go. 13 years, you know long time so he says one more condition see when Abu Saleh Musa had walked into the garden Abdullah Somi had a, small, had a young daughter and he was making dua to Allah to send someone pious to be her husband and when this when, when he walks into this garden, he says, this is the one. This is the answer to my prayer. So he says, you have to marry my daughter. But before you say yes, know that she is blind. She is deaf. She is mute. She's crippled. She, can't, she does not walk and she can't use her hands. Blow your mind. So he says, is there no other way? You know what I mean? He says, no, there's no other way. This is the only way. He said, if you marry her, then I will forgive you. You know, before as I'll see, now he said, if you do this, now I'll forgive you. You see, he agreed. You know, this is the price for eating one apple that he did not have permission to eat. You know, we think about ourselves, all of the stuff we do every day without even thinking about the hereafter. Abdullah Somayhi himself, the father of the bride, conducts the marriage ceremony, the marriage take, the wedding takes place, you know, he, he, he says, you know, he, he says yes, and then he goes to see, meet his wife. And when he enters the room, you know, he sees this beautiful girl standing there. And he runs out. He runs out, he leaves, and the next day, next morning, her father comes and says, you know, where is your husband? She said, he left. You know, he entered the room and he didn't say anything, he just left. So his father-in-law comes and finds him in the garden. He says, what happened? He said, you described this person like this, and when I walked into the room, it was, you know, it was the total opposite. So I said, you know, this can't be her. I've come to the wrong place. He said, look, he said, that is my daughter. <coughs> but he said, you said she was blind. He said, yes. Because she has never looked upon anything that is haram. I said she was deaf because she's never heard anything that is haram. She is mute because she has never said anything that is haram. She has never walked toward anything that is haram. She has never touched anything or done anything with her arms that is haram. You know, today our lives, if we don't do haram, we think we can't exist. But it was this union that brought forth Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani. You know, we want to be doing whatever, and then we expect our kids to do the right thing. And it doesn't work that way. You know, Allah makes exceptions. 
You know, sometimes you'll see, okay, the parents are totally messed up, and you see the kids are, are really decent. You know, but those are exceptions to the rule. Or vice versa. Again, those are exceptions to the rule. At a very young age, his father passes away. And then his mother, through hardship, you know, she sends him to the local imam to go and learn the Qur'an. And he gets there, and he's a young boy, you know, four or five years old at that time. And, you know, the imam, the qahir, uh, Hafiz Sahib asked him, you know, recite what you know from the Qur'an. You know, do you memorize some surah? He said, yes, yeah. recite what you know. So he starts reciting. And by the time he finishes reciting, he's recited 18 paras, or 18 juz of the Qur'an. And so, Imam Hafiz Sahib says, who taught you this? So he says that, you know, my mother used to recite when she was carrying me. And I would listen to her and I memorized it from then. So when he was born, he had already, you know, he was born memorized, see, 18 juz, or 18 paras of the Qur'an. Again, you have to remember when we're talking about him, because, you know, we, talk, we start talking about his miracles and people, you know, think, oh, this is, you know, fantasy or, or fairy tales. Uh, the miracles of the Awliya Allah and their lives, again, parallel the miracles and the lives of the Prophets. Right? And we'll come back to this point again and again. So, of course, you know, he studies locally for a little while, and then his mother, because the center of learning was Baghdad. That's where all the big scholars were. You know, and at this time, when we say big scholars, we're not talking about you know YouTube scholars, uh, you know, who, who talk big. Uh, but when you listen to what they've said, it's the total opposite of what the aqidah should be. You know, at this time, when we're talking, this is when the when the only Allah were still under the flag of Az Zahir, one of the names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is Az Zahir, which means the apparent. You know, today they are under the flag of Al Batin, which is the hidden. This is the other other name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because of conditions, now they've had to shift. So at this time, they're Az-Zahir. And this is where all of these scholars are, is Baghdad. This is where everybody who wants to learn anything goes. And so his mother, toiling for a long time, collects some money to send her son who, difference of opinion as to exactly how old, but relatively in his teens, you know, she sends him, and as she's sending him, she, she sews uh, the coins into his shirt, you know, so that way they don't get lost and nobody steals them. Because along the way, you have all of these looters, you know, caravans getting looted all the time. <laughs> And so as, he's, as they're going, and as he's leaving, his mother says, promise me you'll never tell a lie. And so, on the way, the caravan gets looted. The looters, of course, they're running around taking stuff from everybody. You know, this is young man. You know, young boy. Well, what's he got? Nothing. I mean, you don't see anything on him. He's got nothing. And so he's standing on the side, and he's looking at these guys running around, taking this from that and that, you know, from somebody and this from somebody else. And he's got, you know, he's, he's looking at it. He's kind of got this smirk on his face, looking at the, at the robbers. And it's, you know, so one of them asks him, he says, you know, what's wrong? He said, why are you, why are you looking at us like this? He said, oh, well, I was just thinking that, you know, these, you guys, you know, you're running after all of these people who don't have anything, and the one who's got something, you're not even looking at him. 
So he says, what do you mean? What do you have? Do you have something? He says, yes. He says, what do you have? He says, I've got 40, you know, silver coins. Dirham. Of course, you know, the guy's in shock. You know, who tells somebody who's going to rob you? Oh, yeah, you know, you know, he's not looking at you. He says, yeah, I got this here too. You know, it's like, take this as well. No one does that. What's wrong with this kid? So he grabs him and he takes him to the leader. He says, this, this, this kid, this is what he's saying. So now the leader asks me, he says, do you have something? He says, yes. He said, what? He says, 40 dirham. He says, where are they? Yeah, right here. He says, they're, they're sewn in there. So they cut the shirt. Of course, all of the coins fall out. So now, you know, the leader was smart. You know, the other ones were just kind of peons running around doing his work. And the leader, he's, he's all the brains behind everything. So he knows, you know, to, write, to ask the right question. He said, why didn't you hide this from us? Why didn't, when you were asked, why didn't you lie? He says, because I promised to my mother that I would not lie. You know, these are the words of a wali that are coming from the heart and going to the heart. You know, they're not like empty words from us. You know, they don't, you know, our words haven't even, uh, you know, entered, entered our hearts. They haven't even looked toward our hearts. He says, because I promised my mother. And as soon as he says that, this leader starts crying. And he says to him, he says, you have remembered the word, you have remembered the promise you made to your mother, and I have forgotten the promise I made to my Lord. You know, alastu bi rabbikum. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked all the souls, am I not your Lord? He says, I have forgotten that promise. Because that promise entails that you will obey your Lord. And immediately all of them, you know, they make tawbah at the hands of Sayyidina Abdul Qadir Jilani rahmatullahi and they are elevated to the, to the rank of only Allah. You know, you know one minute a looter and, and robber, and the very next second, the friend of Allah. You know, the verse in the Quran, that indeed, for the friends of Allah, there is no fear and there is no grief. You know, you look at people in the world and people think that, oh, you know, he's living such a lavish lifestyle that he's just worry-free and he's got no worries and no concerns uh, but when you start if you look at him from the inside you find the exact opposite you know people who have a lot of wealth now they're always worried about you know initially they were worried about how they're going to get their wealth and now they're worried about how to keep their wealth you know they can't go to sleep at night you know, because they're worried about somebody going to take something. You know, it's like the story of, of uh, uh, the boy with marbles. You know, this young, this boy, he's got a jar of marbles. And so one day this girl comes and she says, I'll trade all of my jacks. She's got a jar full of jacks. And she says, I'll trade all of my jacks for all of your marbles. So the boy says, fine. So he gives her the bottle and he takes her her jacks, but in the process he keeps one of the marbles. Of course the deal was all for all. So that night he can't sleep. And not because, you know, he couldn't sleep, not because, you know, he kept the marble. He couldn't sleep because he's worried she might have done the same thing to him. That she might have kept some of the jacks. He's worried, did I get all the jacks or not? You know? So if you look at, at these people, you look at, you know, throughout history, Firaun, Haman, all of these guys. And Firaun was not just then, Firaun is all the time. There's always a Firaun. You know, the Firaun of this Ummah is Abu Jahl, but Abu Jahl left all of his students. So 
So they're always, there's, you know, for the friends of Allah, they're always at ease. You know, and the interesting thing is that, you know, here you have, you know, it's, this is not a one-sided track. The friends of Allah, you know, Allah is their friend. You know, they say that Allah is their friend. So what does Allah say? You know, it's like if you love somebody and they don't reciprocate that love, it doesn't really matter. You know, that is the destruction of the lover. You know, if his beloved doesn't reciprocate the love, for the true lover, that's annihilation. You know. Allahu waliyu ladina amanu. يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى نُورِ Allah is the friend of the believers. So it's not that, you know, Allah is, you know, that the, the only Allah consider Allah their friend. Allah considers the only Allah as His friend. Hmm? It's a two-way track. It's reciprocated hmm? on both sides. And what does He do for them? He takes them out of the darknesses you know, not out of the darkness, but the darkness says to the light. And of course, who is the light other than Rasulullah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the light. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes, you know, his friends out of the darknesses and to his beloved. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But, you know, when his mother sends him, say Abdul Qadir Jilani. And, you know, and if you think of only Allah, you know, if somebody says only Allah, immediately the thought goes to say the Abdul Qadir Jilani, you know, to the king of the Sultan of only Allah. When he arrives in, in Baghdad, you know, he starts studying under, under one of the great sheikhs there, Hamad, Rahmatullah. And then, of course, you know, his mother sent him with some money. Money doesn't last very long. If you don't have income coming in and you have income going out, you know, you got expenses going out and no income coming in, eventually it runs out. You know? And so, you know, these are people who are focused on their studies. He didn't have time to earn a living. His reliance was on Allah. He's waiting, you know, he's studying. You know, all his money goes into his studies. And now there's nothing left. So now what do you eat? And these are also not people who beg. Again, their reliance is on Allah. And they know that Rasulullah is aware of their condition. You know, these are people who acknowledge Allah as Hazar or Nazir, and they also acknowledge the Rasulullah as Hazar or Nazir, seeing and present. So there are a lot of stories because he would run out of money, and then, you know, but one incident that, that's interesting is that one day he went and they would go to the jungle and they'd find whatever they could and eat it. You know, anything that was growing, that was, you know, so one day he goes there and there are a lot of other students there. And so he, you know, he feels ashamed that I shouldn't take anything because if I take something, then I'm violating the rights of my brothers. So he leaves. He hadn't eaten in a few days and he's starting to fall down, weakness. He, he gets, finally gets into the masjid. He lays down in a corner and he sees this man walk in and he brings out the food. You know, he has some food and he takes it out and he starts eating it. And Sayyidina Qadi Jalani, he's looking at the man and his mouth is moving. You know, he's imagining he's eating some food. And so the man, he notices him and he invites him. He says, come and eat with me. So they sit down, they start eating. And they start talking. And he says, what's your name? He says, Abdul Qadir. He says, where are you from? He says, Gilan, which is part of Iran. You know, Gilani is the Arabic version of Gilan. The Persian version is Gilan, which is where it actually is. So he says, Gilan. He says, uh, what's your mother's name? 
And then, why do you want to know my mother's name? You know, like, so he tells him, he says, he says, in reality, you are not my guest. He says, I am your guest. He says, when I left, I, I was passing through Gilan, and when I was passing, I was coming to Baghdad, and I met your mother, and she told me that she had a son in, in, in named Abdul Qadir in Baghdad, and she gave me some money to give to you. And so I came, and I started looking for you, and I couldn't find you, and no one, you know, could, could direct me in your direction, so, uh, towards you, so I, you know, I ran out of money. I ran out of money, and I, so I started spending your money. And this food that we're eating, I bought with your money. So, I bought this with your money, so you are, I am your guest. And so, you know, they finished eating. And uh, Sayyid Abdul Qadir, and there was a little money left that he still had. And of course, the man now has to get back to where he came from. So he said that Abdul Qadir Jilani up there tells him to keep the money. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide. Which he did. You know, and, and it's interesting later on, you know, he went through all of these hardships because people talk about his later life. You know, I've heard Mulvi Sabs talking about him, you know, and about how how wealthy he was and how he never wore the same clothes, you know, uh, twice. Uh, you know, every day he would wear a new suit. You know, they never mentioned the earlier beginning. They also, they only mention the ease because that justify what they're doing. But they also don't mention, you know, that yes, you know, later on he was very wealthy. Uh, but he didn't care for the wealth. You know, he only, he wore a new, new set of clothes every day, but what did he do with the old set? You know, every day he would put on a new suit, and the suit he took off, he would give in... To, you know, to the poor every day. So at any one moment, he only had one pair of clothes. Of course, we go to the closet and we can't even think which one we're going to put on. You know, it takes us 20 minutes to decide what am I going to put on. Yeah. The, you know, the famous story about you know, one time he was sitting with his students and a man comes to him and says that, you know, your ship, is, he had sent a ship on, on a trip, on, on a, uh, a, uh, a business journey. And, you know, the man comes and tells him that, you know, your, your ship, news has reached us that there was a storm and your ship sank with all of you know, the products and everything on board and everything was lost. And say the Abdul Qadi Jilani, he puts his head down for a second and he raises it up and he calmly, he says, Alhamdulillah. You know, the man leaves and then a while later comes back and says, oh, you know, that news was wrong. You know, that wasn't your ship. Your ship reached the, the, the coast safely. Uh, that was some other ship, but yours is safely and, and everything's intact. And then he does the same thing. He puts his head down, you know, just for a second. He raises up, and in the same exact manner, he says, Alhamdulillah. You know? And so now this man, he's, he's wondering, you know, you know, it wasn't like, you know, Alhamdulillah and Alhamdulillah. It was just the same, no difference. So he says, you know, when I came the first time and told you this, you know, bad news, you said, Alhamdulillah. And then when I give you this good news, you in the same manner, you say, Alhamdulillah. He says, when you came the first time, I looked in my heart and I, I, I was see, looking if there was any grief, you know, any sadness or sorrow for the loss. And I didn't find any, so I said, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And when you came the second time, I was looking to see if there was any joy you know, over this, this material wealth. And I didn't find any, so I said, Alhamdulillah. You know, this Isa al -Islam, he said that no one attains piety until there is no difference for him between sand and gold. You know, 
And again, the lives of the Anbiya, of, of the Allah parallel the lives of the Anbiya. Before I get to the last part of what I want to talk about, there's one other aspect. And again, I'm not going to tell you about all the miracles because if you look at, at uh, all, of the old, all of the scholars who have any legitimacy agree upon the fact that there are more miracles narrated or attributed to Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani rahmatullah than anybody else, than any other, only Allah. All of them agree upon this. But, you know, so, you know, if you look at his miracles, so I'm not going to tell you about the miracles of, you know, him raising the dead, you know, pulling, pulling people who have been dead out of the water for, for, who are dead for years, pulling whole boats of people who had been dead for years out of the water, you know, or raising uh, uh, cemeteries, you know, out, uh, you know, and you know, all the other miracles that he did. You know, but again, you know, if you look at the Quran, you know, because again, people say, oh, these are just fairy tales. You know, so for a Muslim to say these are just fairy tales, well, now let's look at the Quran. You know, if an atheist says that, well, they also say the Quran is a fairy tale. That's the approval. You know, but for a Muslim to say that, let's look at the Quran. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us in the Quran? Surah Baqarah. You know, we know the stories of Isa al-Islam raising the dead. But people don't look at Surah Baqarah. Why is Baqarah called Baqarah? You know, Baqarah in Arabic, you know, it's cow. It's not goat, like it is in Urdu. And it's not Baqarah in, in Urdu either, but it's Baqarah. But uh, why is Baqarah Baqarah? Because of the story of the cow. What is the story of the cow? You know, you start reading from, you know, it's early in the surah, roughly around verse number 60 or so. So, during the time of Musa al -Islam, there's a man who was murdered. There are no witnesses to the, to the crime. And he is left at the doorsteps of this other village. And the people over here are accusing this village of having murdered him. So, when this accusation is thrown out, now you, you're sp about to get a war between these two people. So one of the elders among them said, look, why do we argue when we have a messenger of Allah amongst us, Musa is, he, is present, so why do we need to argue? Let, let's go to him and let him decide. Musa al Islam comes and you know they tell him, you know, this side is accusing this and there are no witnesses. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa al Islam, what? He says, Tell them to sacrifice a cow. You know, one lesson we get from this is that if you're in difficulty, you should give sadaqah. You know, and this is this is the nature of the Anbiya, and this is the nature of the household of Rasulullah you know, whether in times of ease or hardship. Alladina, Alladina yunfakuna fi sarra'i wa dharra'i wal kaadimina al ghayda wa laafina al nas wa Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. You know that those who give in times of hardship and in times of ease. You know, who, who control their anger, who forgive the people, you know, and then Allah loves those who are muhsin. Of course, this verse was revealed in honor of the, again, the household of Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, so they're told sacrifice a cow. You know, they could have taken any cow. 
But what do they do? They say, well, we want to know what kind of cow this is, what color it is, what age, all of these things. And you read the Quran, you know, it tells you all of these things. And so then they are all directed toward one particular cow. Who did that cow belong to? It could belong to the friend of Allah, to an only Allah from the Ummah of Bani Israel. Where is that only Allah at that time? He's in his grave. And then Allah Subhanahu commands that you take this cow that belonged to this Oli Allah and you sacrifice it, you skin it, and you take a piece of flesh from it, and they took the tail, and you hit the dead body. And who hits the dead body? Not Musa al Islam, but one of them. Dead plus dead plus dead doesn't equal life, normally. Hmm? But this isn't just any cow. And this uh, isn't just anyone in the grave. This is the friend of Allah in his grave. And this is his cow. Hmm? So Allah says, is take the flesh of this cow, not even the cow itself, not even the live cow, but the flesh of the cow after it's been sacrificed, and you hit the dead body with it. And what happens to the dead body? The dead body now comes to life. You know, the story is in Surah Baqarah, Surah number two. Yeah. Musa, why didn't Musa Islam simply make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have him go through this whole process? Because he wants to emphasize the position of the only Allah. And this isn't the only Allah of the Ummah of Rasulullah, so some, this is the only Allah of the previous nations. So just like the status of Rasulullah Sallallahu over all of the other Anbiya, the status of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu over all the other nations, and the status of the only Allah of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu over all the other only Allah. So he takes this dead body and you hit the live uh, the other dead body and now that dead body becomes alive. And then he witnessed that his nephew is the one who killed him and threw him there and, and all of that. Hmm? So why is Allah SWT directing us in, in, towards this? You know, so that when the when the uh, when the only Allah of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi do their things, then that shouldn't be hard for us to understand. If the miracles of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi are unlimited, then the miracles of the of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi the only Allah of the of, of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi are also unlimited. unlimited. I might end with this. Because normally when I say I'm ending with this, something else comes up. So I might end with this. Okay. While Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani was studying. You know, and again, when we talk about the status of Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani as being the king of the Oli of Allah, again, this is undisputed. You know, this is something that was accepted by everybody at the time and everybody afterwards who has any legitimacy. You know, you know if you look at the, the writings of the scholars, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, you know, there's difference. Uh, our Sheikh used to say, uh, you know, say Muhammad Yusuf Ali Suleimani, that, you know, in, yeah, you know, in the Maulwis, you have he is mine and he is yours and this and that. You know, because they're always arguing or fighting. You know, in the only Allah, there's no such thing as, you know, this one is mine and this one's yours and this and that. You know, he, he used to say, he says, Ek ka manzoor, sab ka manzoor. Ek ta mardood, sab ka mardood. You know, if he's accepted by one, he's accepted by all. And if he's rejected by one, he's rejected by all. Uh, Sheikh, uh, 
امام ربانی مجدد الفتانی شیخ احمد سر هندی رحمت اللہ علیہ you know, and the reason I'm mentioning him is because I could mention anybody else and they all have the same opinion but I'm mentioning him because a lot of people think that maybe he has a different opinion because he is Farooqi he is from the lineage of Sayyidina Umar Farooq and Naqshbandi who people think that you know there's no connection with Ali yet there is uh, you know, and they're easy, it's easily seen for those who want to see it he wrote in his maktub that again that the that the king of the only Allah is always from the lineage of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you know if you look at his, his students or those who came after him as I said you know Qadi San Allah Pani Pati but also like uh, Sayyid Mahmoud Alusi who is the student of uh, Khalid Khordi, who is the student of Sayyid Abdullah, whose kunya is Ghulam Ali, who is the Khalifa of Mirza Mazare Jani Jana. You know, in his tafsir uh, rule Maani, you know, he writes the same thing, and he says that Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani, you know, he is Sultan Awliya Allah, he is the king, and there is no one who is Wali without his approval. <laughs> so when they were studying, when he was Abdul Qadir Jiyan was studying one day, you know, he had two other co-students. So they had some free time. And so they decided, one of them, you know, they decided, well, why don't we go and meet some of the friends of Allah? And there was a man in Baghdad who was known as Ghaus of Baghdad. And he was the Ghaus of his time. And it was known that, you know, he wouldn't be there at one moment and suddenly he's there. You know, it's kind of like teleportation. He's there and he's not there. And, uh, and because for, the, for people like this at this station, again, their miracles parallel the miracles of Rasulullah. So for them, time, time travel has no, you know, it's nothing. Space travel is nothing. You know, it's, you know, second nature for them. So when they get, the three of them, they go, and all, on the way they're talking, and one of them says that, you know, I'm going to go there, and we're going to go there, and I'm going to ask him such a question that he won't be able to answer it. You know, basically to kind of try to humiliate him. And the other one says, you know, I'm going to ask him some questions, but I'm going to wait for an answer. You know, I'm going to give him some time to think about it. And Sayyid Abdul Qadi Jilani, he says, look, you know, we're going to meet the friends of Allah. This is the friend of Allah. I mean, why are you going to do this? You know, we just go and receive blessings from him. So they go and they get there. And when they arrive at the place that he normally is, there's no one there. And so the, you know, they're looking and they're talking to each other and suddenly he's there. And as soon as he gets there, he says to the first one, he says that you said like this, that you said you would ask me a question and I wouldn't be able to answer it. And he says, this is your question and this is your answer and you will die as a kafir. And the other one, he said that you said like this and this was your question and that you had thought you were going to ask me and this is the answer to your question and you will, you will deep, you know, you will, you will grow through many difficulties and fall very low to the extent that you will almost lose your iman, but then it will be given back to you. And then to Abdul Qadir Jilani, he says, I see the day. I am seeing the day. He doesn't say, I see the day. He says, I am seeing the day when you will be sitting on the member of Baghdad and you will say that all the necks of all the only Allah are under your feet <laughs> and so of course a few years later what happens Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullah is sitting on the member in Baghdad and he says he makes this statement that the necks of all the only Allah are under my feet you know which is interesting before I go on, go on into this a little further interesting because you know, you become wali through prayers and doing all of these additional things and all of this and all of that. 
you know, this is the miracle of Abdul Qadir Jilani that he makes the wali, you know, through his feet. When he makes this statement, the first to respond to his statement is Moinuddin Chishti Rahmatullah. Ajmeri, who at that time is in the in the mountains of Khurasan. And from there in the spiritual realm he replies. And he says, also upon my head and on my eyes. Hmm? Acknowledging the position. But why did he? Because they're cousins from the mother's side. He says also, not just, you might, your foot might be on everybody else's necks, but your foot is not only on my neck, but it's also on my head and upon my eyes. Hmm? Hmm? Now, one of the other only Allah, he was, he was, sitting close by and he puts his head under he says I am the first to respond and to say the Duqadi Jani Rahmatullah says no you're not the first the first is Moinuddin Shishti none of the again none of the only Allah regardless of which silsila they belong to have any any objections or any issues with this they all acknowledge this point when he starts teaching or when he starts lecturing uh, and one of the reasons he's known as Pir Anapir and this is just one there are many reasons but one of them is that when he started lecturing you know seven of his teachers you know who teacher of fiqh and hadith and different fields of science within Islam they started talking amongst each other and said you know you, know, you get this Sometime, you know, uh, you know, this student, this young boy, he was just a, a boy in front of us, and now he's lecturing. You know, so, of course, human nature, there's that thing of, oh, you know, he's taking students away from me, or, or you know, now people won't pay attention to me. So they say, uh, you know, let's go, and we'll, we'll, we'll stand up in his lecture, and we'll ask him questions, so uh, that that will be in, 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 so hard for him to answer. Then we'll show the people, ah, you know, why are you listening to him? You know, come listen to us. And so they all, each one, you know, picks some questions from his field of specialty that we're going to ask him. And they come, you know, and say that the Qadi Jilan is giving this this majlis, this lecture. And they come and they're hooded and they kind of sneak in and they kind of sit in, inside and in the back in the in the corner. And as he's speaking, he says, he says, "What good is that knowledge that people learn to try to humiliate others? May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wipe this knowledge clean from people's hearts." And when he does this motion, all the knowledge that these teachers had was gone. And now each one is trying to think, what was I going to ask him? They can't remember what they were going to ask him. They can't even remember anything else. You know? They're struggling with their own names. <laughs> and so they come, they realize, you know, they're looking at each other and they realize each one, you know, what are you going to ask? I don't know. What, what do you know? I don't know. You know. I don't even know what I don't know. You know? So they come, they realize, What's happened? So they come to him and they fall to his feet, you know, begging his his forgiveness. And so we were sorry and for what we've done. And he says, you know, and then he says, he says, Ya Allah, you know, replace that knowledge with something that is good. And when again he swipes his hand, you know, and all of this knowledge, true knowledge, with the true understanding, you know, and without the ego, now comes rushing into their hearts. You know, again. You know, these are the friends of Allah and for whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing to do whatever. You know, what does he say about his friends? That I become the hands with which they grab, the feet with which they walk, the eyes with which they see, the tongues with which they talk. And if one of them insist upon something from me, then I fulfill their insistence. Now, this is why these people can change the taqdeer, change your fate. Uh -huh. yeah. 
You know, Imam Rabbani he said that I look at the at the low, low al mahfuz and I can change what is written. Said Abdul Qadir, but he did it, how did he do it? He would do it through Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani. He, he also acknowledges this. Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani, Rahmatullah he says, I erase and change people's fates. They're not just saying this. You know, these are things that, that, that have been witnessed uh, by multiple witnesses. Uh, eight more minutes? Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Uh, you know, there's a lot. But coming back, you know, to the significance aspect of this. And again, you know, people, you know, this concept that some people have that, well, I'm not from that lineage of, of Rasulullah so they feel kind of, uh, uh, they try to justify uh, ideas that aren't legitimate. You know, so, well, I'm not from that lineage, so now they want to downplay that lineage. You know, you know. Everybody has their place. You know, if you look at the Sahaba al-Qur'an and you look at the Ahl al-Bayt, you know, yeah, the, if you look at the, the uh, attitudes of Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar Farooq, or the, uh, toward the family of Rasulullah you start to understand or you should start to understand the significance of Ahlul Bayt there is a narration which is mentioned by Ibn Hajar Makki in a book that he wrote Mark, which he wrote in refutation to refute the Shia ideology but in that he narrates a hadith or a narration where during the time of Umar and he, and he and he right narrates it as a legitimate incident, you know. So he doesn't say no, this isn't correct. He says this is correct. So he says that during the time of Umar, radiallahu anhu, there was a drought, and for weeks, Umar radiallahu had been making the the salat of of for rain, and there was no rain. So the people came to Omar, right there after this happening for several weeks now. They said, you know, you're making this dua and nothing's happening. So do something. I mean, this is Omar, right for whom Rasulullah said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the tongue of Omar. This is Umar for whom Rasulullah said that every nation has a muhaddath. Muhaddath, not muhaddith. Muhaddath is scholar of hadith. Muhaddath, which is the one who the angels speak to. He says every nation has muhaddath. And if there's any muhaddath among my nation, it is Umar. This is the Umar for whom Rasulullah said that the, that the deeds of my Umar are like the stars. This is the Umar. For whom Rasulullah said that, you know, when Omar goes this way, Shaitan goes the other way. This is the Omar who is Ashir Mubashir. So they come to him and they say, do something. You know, you keep making this dua and nothing's happening. So he tells him, he says, come back tomorrow and I'll take care of this. So they come and he says, let's go. Where does he go? He goes to the house of Abbas. The uncle of Rasulullah. He knocks on the door, Abbas and says, Man, who? He says, Omar. He says, why did you come? He says, you know, the people are, are, you know, are tired and they want rain. There's no rain. So Abbas tells me, he says, you sit here. I will go and get the real people who can do this. So he goes to who? 
he goes to Ali. There's a hadith in Al Adab al Mafrud, which is a book that written by Imam Bukhari, where he says that every time Ali would meet Abbas, he would kiss his feet. Abbas, Ali would kiss the feet of Abbas. Even though the status of Ali is far greater than the status of Abbas. But out of respect for his uncle, every time, it's not like once or twice. You know, he did it one time and okay, yeah. No, every time he would meet his uncle, he would kiss his feet, out of respect. So people that, that object to us kissing the feet of our sheikh, yeah. or, 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 or kissing, you know, the feet of our parents who have passed, or our parents. You know, they they need to object to this then. And again, the the narrator is Imam Bukhari. So he goes and he gets Ali Radha, and and Ali Radha brings with him who Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein al -Islam. And then they start walking out. You know, they come and they start. They say, we will go out. So they go to the outskirts of the city to make the door. Hmm? But as they're leaving, you know, they tell Umar that no one from the Ummah should follow us, should, come, should be with us. You can see from a distance, but no one will come with us. We will make this door. And Jabir ibn Abdullah says that he was watching them from a distance. And before they made the dua, and before they 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 you know they raised their hands to make the dua, and before they wa they they wiped their or put their hands over their faces, the rain was already coming down. And as they did this, they they washed the rain upon their face. Allah gives this to whoever He wills. And anyone who asks why is the brother of Shaitan. So, you know, again, this is the company of Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani. Rasulullah said that, that a, man is, man, a man's religion is the religion of his friends. You know, the one he gets up and down with, the one he meets. The one he associates with. That's his religion. You know, people lose their aqidah, their belief, because they associate with those whose aqidah is messed up. Hmm? Ibn Sirin, rahmatullahi who is tabi, he is faqi, he is, he is, you know, of course people, you say Ibn Sirin, everybody thinks, oh, you know, uh, a dream interpreter. That was one of his fields. He is faqih to the extent that the Sahaba respected him. His mother, who was a slave of Abu Bakr, she, when she passed away, three of the wives of Rasulullah bathed her, gave her a ghusl. The companions respected him, they respected his knowledge. One day he's sitting and a khawarij comes. You know, those whose aqidah, you have, you know, the Shia on one extreme and you have the khawarij on the other side and you have the various branches of each one. You know, no one wants to be in the middle. You know, Islam is the middle. So a khawarij comes and he sits next to Ibn Sirin. Ibn Sirin is sitting with his students. Ibn Sirin tells him, leave, get up and go. I don't want you close to me. He says, what? What's wrong? What's wrong? Let me recite to you some verses of the Quran. Oh. Ibn Sirin says, I don't want to hear Quran from you. Leave. He says, well, if you're not going to listen to the Quran, let me, let me narrate some of the hadith of Rasulullah so some. There are many khawarij who are narrators of hadith. Many, many khawarij. So let me narrate some hadith of Rasulullah to you. He says, I don't want to hear hadith from you. Leave. 
He says, either you leave or I leave. He says, he, so the man, he finally, he left. His students then asked him, he said, why didn't you know, the man, he's just going to recite Quran. He's just going to narrate Hadith, why didn't you listen? He says, if I had listened to that from him, then perhaps my heart would become mild toward him. And, and if I had listened to him, then perhaps, you know, and he would, when he would say this, the hadith, you know, he would, the inflections and everything changed the meaning. You know, it's like we were talking about yesterday. You know, how they, they interpret things. You know, there's hadith of Imam, uh, Imam Nawawi, 40 hadith, famous hadith book. This hadith occurs in Bukhari, Muslim, many hadith books. That actions are but by intentions. The Rasulullah continues in the hadith. He says what? He says, he who's, who's immigration, who emigrated from Mecca to Medina, who's, whose immigration is for Allah and his messenger, emigrated for Allah and his messenger. And he who immigrated you know, to gain some wealth or to marry a woman, his, his immigration is for that. So the commenter on the hadith says, oh, see, your, your intentions need to be pure. That whatever we intend and whatever we do, we should intend and do that for, for the sake of Allah alone. On the surface, it sounds very good. We should do this for Allah alone. For no one else other than Allah. Allah and his messenger Rasulullah Rasul says Allah and his messenger He says no 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 Not the messenger it's Allah alone no. So they do these things And people you know you, you listen to it Superficially you think oh wow yeah it sounds really nice But before you know it your iman is gone no. And then those are the people Who start saying oh you know, I used to respect Abdul Qadir, I, I don't think he's anything anymore. Uh, you know, just, just fairy tales. Time's up. And I talked longer than I thought I would talk. <laughs> and I actually went one, one minute over what you wanted me to go. So, uh, I'll stop here, inshallah. You know, I, again, you know, these are just kind of... Uh, Scratching the surface, you know. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, guide us and, and protect us, and and uh, you know, give us His true love, because that true love, the love, true love, His true love, and the true love of His Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu And there's no difference in this love. This is one love, and that love, if He gives it to us, that love will become our guide and our teacher. And without that love, nothing has any meaning. You know, and the love, and with that love also is included the love of Ahlul Bayt and the love of Sahaba Ikram. And all of whom Allah and His Messenger love. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's make salam and then we make dua and then we eat, inshallah. I wish we could have continued. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's one man's opinion. <laughs> <laughs> You get reward for that, inshallah. <laughs> Ya Habib, salam alayka, salamatullah alayka. Tum Habib kibriya ho, aur imam ul-anbiya ho, do jahaan ke peshwa ho, shafiroh se jaza ho. Ya Nabi, salam alayka, Ya Rasul, salam alayka Ya Habib, salam alayka Salawatullah alayka 
रहमतों के ताज वाले दो जहां के राज वाले आशियों की लाज वाले अर्श की मेराज वाले या नबी सलाम का या रसूल सलाम का या हबीब सलाम का जान की जान की काफी सहारा ले लिया है दर तुम्हारा खल्क के वारिस खुदारा लो सलाम अब तो हमारा या नबी सलाम का या रसूल सलाम का या हबीब सलाम का सलावा शफी 
successful in their struggle uh, and uh, again give them death with Iman uh, because the world will come to an end uh, our lives will end soon uh, but if we do not die with Iman then there is no meaning to uh, to our being here and give us you know, the true understanding uh, in, in, of, of your beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and in our graves make, make him a light for us and allow us to recognize him and to honor him uh, and to kiss his feet uh, and, uh, and make him an intercessor upon our behalf in the hereafter uh, and uh, give us the understanding and, and make, it, make it where uh, we are accepted by, by, by your friends as, as, as their, their slaves. I guess as we're uh, getting the food ready, uh, any questions? Of course, I talk too much. Uh, like I said, I sound like a broken record to myself. Uh, but uh, any questions? Good. So everybody understood everything. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. 